Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be looking at my 10 favourite albums by the incredible Herbie Hancock. Um, this, I'm not saying this is a definitive best of, this will be my favourite albums, right? So, um, but I have tried to come up with 10 albums that I think if you were to buy all 10 would be pretty representative of Herbie's career, which is a career that has gone on for 60 years, so it's a, it's a long time. Uh, he seems to have petered out making albums. We haven't had a Herbie Hancock album for a long time. I don't think, I think it's almost like 20 years since we've had a Herbie Hancock album. Um, Herbie Hancock is one of the visionary, iconic jazz fusion musicians and I just haven't covered him enough on this channel. And I felt I really needed to. Now the reason for that is, is that I did a top 10 with for, over at Sea of Tranquility. Uh, it wasn't just me, it was a whole bunch of guys coming in, you know, I think it was Pete and it may have been, uh, it was either Charles Alvarez or um, George Lamy, I can't, you can, anyway, the point is, if you want to go over and see my top 10 then, I decided not to look at that top 10 when I came up with this, so it could be different. Um, this channel is about top 10 videos, right, this is not set in stone you know i can change my mind you know this is what was great so here we are november 2022 and here is at, at this moment in time my 10 favorite herbie hancock albums ranked from 10 to 1. so we just kick off and i'm going to say a little bit about each album and why i put it on the list and why they're there and all that type of stuff um so um at number 10 i have fat albert rotunda from I think 1968 or 69. I'm going off my memory here. I've got no notes. Um, so I think it's it's late 60s. I think 68. Right now, Fat Albert Rotunda, you know, is um, I think is an incredibly important album in the history of jazz fusion, and I really wanted to make that point on this channel where we really get into the history of jazz fusion. Um, Herbie Hancock emerges in the Miles Davis Quintet, the great Miles Davis Quintet of the 1960s. He also signs to Blue Note in 1962, making his first album, which I think is called Taking Off, right? Um, he makes some incredible jazz albums throughout the 60s. Towards the end of the 60s, he gets out of his Blue Note contract and the style of what he changes, changes. And in 68, he gets asked by Bill Cosby to do the soundtrack for a cartoon, which um, I don't think he's called Fat Albert Rotunda, but as I cannot remember it here, I will call it Fat Albert Rotunda. And he decides to come up with um, a completely different sound, um, which is can only be described as jazz rock or jazz funk. Now, jazz funk is another thing. You know, when we talk about the history of jazz fusion, it starts off as jazz rock, it's pioneered you know, really by the Mavish Nocturne. When the Mavish Nocturne make that album, In the Mountain Flame, it creates a certain thing and then you see a lot of bands changing their style to line up with this sort of jazz rock or to be more ac accurate, uh, jazz progressive rock. Um, there's another undercurrent that then comes up through jazz fusion, which is the funky side of it. And a lot of musicians move slowly over to it. You know, Weather Report, who was sort of channeling a sort of what was happening on Bitches Brood in a Silent Way, slowly move towards the funk. Um, Herbie Hancock, it can be argued, um, moves towards the funk with Headhunters, but I don't think that's the case because with Fat Albert Rotunda, we have a very successful, I'm not saying a masterpiece, but a highly successful jazz rock, jazz funk album in 1968. Now, it's hard to pin down albums that do that successfully. Herbie Hancock does it with that album. There's some incredible funky grooves on there, some great players on there. If you haven't heard it, go and check it out, especially if you like the later Headhunters funk of Herbie Hancock. So that's what I got number 10. Right, at number nine, I have Future Shock. Now, is Future Shock one of my favorite Herbie Hancock albums? No, I actually find it quite troublesome. It's a troublesome listen, right? So Herbie Hancock's career, he goes from being a great jazz pianist to sort of developing a jazz funk sound with Headhunters, which goes to almost like a jazz disco sound. Um, he starts to have hit records. He becomes at one point almost like a pop star th towards the late 70s with that sort of vocoder type of um, approach of, of disco records, which I think are weaker creatively. Um, 
in the early 80s, he's looking around for something else and he teams up with the great producer Bill Laswell and he makes an album called Future Shock. On that album is a record called Rocket. And that Rocket not only becomes a huge hit single, but actually defines the sound of the 1980s, especially the sound of hip hop. It's incredibly important. It's also one of the biggest selling jazz records, although this is not jazz. Future Shock, that album is not a jazz album. What this is, is um, a pop album made by a jazz musician that has already crossed over to pop music. Um, if you listen to the track Rocket, there is a keyboard solo, which is barely a keyboard solo. It lasts for a few bars and it's only really a solo for the first few bars and then it settles down into more of a groove. Um, that is it. The rest of it is programmed, funk, sequenced, hip-hop grooves, right? Um, now, Herbie Hancock had a huge success with this album and many other jazz fusion artists tried to move over to that style. Um, an example of that would be Herbie Hancock, um, which, who made an album just after this with the title of Future even in the album. I can't remember the, the album's title is because uh, I wasn't expected to talk about Stanley. Um, no, it's not going to come. Uh, so many artists went over to this and it was appalling. There's so many artists that ruined themselves by bringing in that sort of 80s sequenced approach. And the reason is, is because their producers weren't good enough. Bill Laswell is an absolute pioneer of that sound. He was at the cutting edge of hip hop at that time. So this album, I believe, has to be on the list. Anybody who's going to approach Herbie Hancock. Now, do I love the, do I love, um, that's, I absolutely do. It's, I love Rocket. There's, there's um, some great songs on there. It's a great funky album and they're few and far between in the early 80s. So um, you will not be disappointed as long as you approach it with an open mind. If you're an out jazz who likes acoustic jazz, you will hate this. But um, that's what I've got at number nine is um, Future Shock. Now at number eight, I've put in one of the um, 1960s jazz albums. There's a whole host of these and these are all pretty much masterpieces. If I was rating this top 10 more objectively, I'm sure that a lot more of the 60s albums would have got on the list, but I decided to go for the two absolute masterpieces and put them on here to represent that era. And the, the number eight I put in Perian Isles, which was, came out in 1964. It's Herbie Hancock's breakthrough album. It's what establishes him as an artist in his own right, as opposed to the pianist in Miles Davis's quintet bringing out solo albums on Blue Note Records. Um, it contains a number of jazz standards. The one that I really want to draw attention to on this channel is of course Cantaloupe Island. Um, so in 1964, with a band which I think comprises of basically the Miles Davis quintet, but with um, Freddie Hubbard replacing Miles, right? A cutting music that I think predates fusion before Miles did it with that quintet. When we get to albums like um, Miles in the Sky, Water Babies, which came out later, when we get to that period and the electric piano comes in, we can hear Tony Williams playing in a much more four square way. But back in 64, he's not doing that so much with the Miles Davis quintet. But with Cantaloupe Island, I think we have that moment where we could almost like pinpoint the beginning of jazz fusion there. Is this, a, this is a contentious point and I'm not too sure about it myself. I'm going to put it out there to the people who watch this channel. We can have a discussion in the comments. Is Cantaloupe Island the first fusion record? It's competing with Sidewinder by Lee Morgan as well for me. But is that the first fusion record? Um, it's funny, I'd, I'd love it to be that because, you know, I've just done a video on heavy metal and I think we can sort of say the first heavy metal record is possibly You Really Got Me by The Kinks, which also came out in 1964. It, would, it, it is an interesting idea that that year, 64, is an important year. I, I think there's a cultural shift uh, across all the arts, across all of our culture in 1962, there's a shift. And by 64, everything's changing. The Beatles are changing. The Rolling Stones are changing music. We've seen things happening in the civil rights music. We've seen cinema changing at that point. 
you know, I think, so for example, 1964 is I think the first time that there was nudity in a mainstream film. For example, there's another example of this shift, you know, um, in the UK, um, there'd been a court case over Lady Chatterley's lover and that had been released. There's a change at this point and it would be very interesting to be able to pinpoint that change in terms of fusion on this album and that's why I've got it in here. Emperor and Isles is an absolute masterpiece as well. It's one of the greatest jazz albums ever made. I kind of pre prefer Herbie's albums over Miles' quintet albums only just a little bit. I think Miles is really, Miles is always experimenting. He's always pushing the boundaries out and that's what we go to listen for and it's wonderful. But with Herbie Hancock, some of these ideas are a lot more um, developed and nailed perhaps. This is what you come for. These are things, everything I'm saying here has got a question mark after it. Perhaps is that the case? What do you think? Right. At number seven, I have Manchild which I think is from 66, 67. It's the beginning of his disco period, but it's still a kicking album that still references the Headhunters. It's not the original Headhunters lineup. It's a much more expanded lineup with Wawa Watson on guitar and a whole bunch of guests, you know. It's a hell of a funky album. I think if I was to say what's the funkiest album ever made, it could well be Manchild by Herbie Hancock. Um, it, it, a, a, an absolute brilliantly funky album. Um, it's is different from the Headhunters, that the sort of bubbling jazz improvisation element that's there on those albums has gone. And we've got much more four square beats all the way through. This can really hem in jazz fusion and jazz improvisation. But Herbie Hancock has always been an incredible composer. Um, <clears throat> he's almost sort of progressive in his compositional approach. And he's able to turn a jazz composition like that at any moment in time. He is not one to go for, you play the head and then you solo, then you play the head. If you're in a disco jazz Fusac world and you play the head, then you solo, those solos are gonna be so hemmed in by that four square disco beat and the repetitive riff that it's, gonna, it's not going to be challenging for someone who really wants to hear someone improvise. And that could have well been the problem with my child, except that Herbie Hancock just will turn the composition on a, on a hairpin and he'll put a context for each solos. And often what the time is, he'll ventilate the, the, the backing. So you get ba ba da bum ba da ba da that sort of question and answer thing, which suddenly revitalizes the track. And you can still be going, da, 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 da. that all could be going on. You see, with my channel, I don't play you the music. I, 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 I can emulate the music like Bobby McFerrin with my voice. Are you impressed with these vocalization skills that you will sometimes get? because I can't be asked to stitch the music, because you know what will happen if I stitch the music in there. Herbie will demonetize it. Herbie will take the money for it. I don't want him to have the money. He's got enough money of himself. Do you know how many copies of Rocket he sold? Anyway, I'm going silly, so let's get back on track. At number six, I have Thrust, which is by the original Headhunters. It's the second album. It uh, hasn't got Harvey Mason on drums. He's gone off to the world of session music, and they bring brought in the incredible Mike Clark, who is a... Fantastic drummer, an absolutely incredible jazz drummer who is really a pioneer of funk drumming. I would put him on the same level as a Clyde Stubblefield or a Bernard Purdy. Um, and um, on Palm Grease, the opening track on Thrust, God, he just comes in with the most incredible, simple, but signature beat. I could play that now and everyone would recognize that track. Um, the thing with Thrust and these early head, head on Ted's albums, it's very funky, but they're still flying, right? They are still improvising. And on a tune like Actual Proof, Herbie really does that thing that I'm talking about, where he creates a compositional structure within which the improvisation can happen, where, where there is like hits and runs and gaps and stops, and the soloist has to weave their way through that labyrinth. You know, they can't just blow, you know, they've got to intelligently play. This is always a way of creating interesting 
improvisation. I often say to my students when they say to me, I just feel like I'm flailing. I'm just, there's no thought. I just end up just blowing. And I say, well, what you need to do is practice over certain chord progressions that are difficult. So you've got to keep concentration and also play over on time signatures because odd time signatures will force you to rhythmically phrase in a certain way. You'll have to intelligently think how you're going to get through this sort of thing. Herbie Hancock is a genius at doing this. And I think there's a reason of how that develops. We'll get onto that later in the video. Um, the uh, tune actual proof at the time was so hard for the band to um, play over and they were all into uh, Buddhism. Um, uh, Herbie Hancock is a Nigerian Buddhist. And so they meditated, and once they meditated, they were able to play through this tune. Uh, and they felt like this was actual proof that, of the truth of what they were doing, which is where the name comes from. A little bit of a musical fact for you then. Right, let's go on to number five. At number five, I have Mawandishi. Right, so let's get a bit of a shape. Um, Herbie Hancock signs to Blue Note and he makes these sort of parallel albums to the Miles Davis Quintet, sharing a lot of those music musicians. They are some of the greatest jazz albums in the world. When he leaves Blue Note, he does a lot of um, other styles. The styles change and what he tends to do is use much larger ensembles and get into much deeper compositions, tunes like Speak Like a Child. Within that, he does... Um, the album uh, Fat Albert Rotunda. Uh, he also does the soundtrack to Death Witch, which are all very important jazz fusion albums. I have represented that with Fat Albert Rotunda because I think it was important. It's not the best of that period. Um, there's a gap then from 69 to 71 where he doesn't make any albums and he returns with a band which is called the Marandishi Band and it makes three albums. Uh, the first two for Werner Brothers, which is Marandishi Crossings, and then the final one for Columbia, I think, which is Sextant. Those albums just get better. In, with those albums, he's taking the ideas that Miles has developed on Bitches Brew and in a silent way, and he's pushing them, and he is exploring ways of improvising on those albums. And he's, he's exploring ways of using a standard jazz um, quintet, with electronics to create an electric jazz form where um, he can create huge amounts of tension. So it's exploring the same areas that Weather Report are also exploring at that time. I find these albums much more interested in than the Weather Report. I think because the Weather Report have this idea on the early albums of sort of everyone soloing that nobody's soloing and that's how they're trying to create the tension. Herbie Hancock's doing it through a compositional process and it allows the musicians to dig so much deeper. Um, on the first album, there is a tune on Marwandishi, which is the album I'm, I put at number five. There is a tune called Ostinato, which also features Ronnie, Mont Ronnie Montrose on guitar. You know, um, I haven't re mentioned Montrose on here. And I, when I did my classic rock talk, I didn't. I should have really put the first Montrose album on as being one of the great classic rock albums, and I didn't. And I, I thought maybe I should have represented that. But it's weird that Montrose actually crops up on this Herbie Hancock album, especially on that track Ostinato, which is in 158, and he's somewhere between Bitches Brew and Hawkwind and early Mavish Nuxia. This at that track just flies. It's one of the great fusion tracks. Mar and Doshi just get, I wouldn't say better. But the Mao and Dashi band just start to integrate electronics more and more. Um, but this one gets on the list for Ostinato. The other tracks are fantastic as well, but that's the incredible track. And at number four, I have the next album, um, which is called Crossings, which um, really explores the electronics deeper and deeper. We get deeper into it with long tracks. He's, He's, he's really exploring like this idea of long form tracks like In A Silent Way and Bitches Brew. But they're so much tightly, more tightly controlled compositionally. And the use of the electronics is absolutely incredible. You know, and if you follow the album crossings through, the electronics seems to come in more and more. This is all down to Patrick Gleason, who they brought in as a sort of, you know, expert on the Moog synthesizer and electronics. 
And I think Herbie Hancock, when he saw what he was doing, he went, no, we're changing this. He's going to become a member of the band. And that's what we see, really digging deep on crossings. Um, at number three, I have Maiden Voyage. Maiden Voyage is perhaps the greatest of the 60s albums. Um, Herbie Hancock himself has said that the track Maiden Voyage is um, perhaps his greatest composition. Why is it so great? Um, well, for a start, it has a whole bunch of things that are going to become really important in jazz fusion. One is chord hits. And that's modal. And that chord, which is like a sus4 chord, is, is very hard to pin down harmonically. And then it goes up a minor third. And, it, and it's a very simple composition. Most people who who have a bit of knowledge of harmony could pick that tune up very very quickly. Any band can jam on that, but it's also increased incredibly heavy. It, it sort of does the very thing that I think Herbie Hancock is great, which is create compositions that allow for meaningful improvisation. Um, the Maiden Voyage is an absolute masterpiece, which is why it's on their list. If I was being objective and say, what is Herbie's most important album and greatest album? I would probably have to say it's uh, it would be Made and Voyage, but there's two albums I have to put above that. So at number two, I have Sextant, which is the final album by uh, the Mawandishi band. The electronics are in full force. It's much funkier than the other albums. It's like an inverted esoteric out there headhunters, right? It is one of the greatest jazz fusion albums ever made. It's essential to any you know jazz fusion collection which is why i'm doing this video so i can say that and of course at number one we have an album that i've always put in my top 10 fusion albums of all time which is the first headhunters album where um he basically takes the sound and the ideas that are in the um Mandishi band and he brings it down he makes it concise apparently he never had the the, the Mandishi band was was such an esoteric, difficult band to listen to. It's a, it's a difficult listen. That he was basically starving. That he was so hard to, and he just could not keep that band on the road. He went out and tour. I think with the Pointer Sisters. And when he saw the Pointer Sisters, he realised that he, he had to pull this in. Now some musicians will pull this in and, and get, become commercial and totally get it wrong. But in Herbie Hancock's case, on her, on Headhunters, he gets it right. He does that because of the riffs. Chameleon has just got an incredible riff. It's an incredible dance record. It's disco before disco. It's got that little skip, that little nod to James Brown, Cold Sweat in there. And it was a huge hit. But the thing that no one realises that bought that single is that when you listen to the album, once you've got past the hit single bit, that then opens up and we have full-on jazz fusion, 1973. Anyway, um... I'm going to finish up there. That was my whistle stop tour through um, my favourite albums by Herbie Hancock. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, like it, right? Put a like on it. If you want to subscribe, then you'll get to hear some more. And if you want to know when I'm doing this, press the notification bell and it will tell you. And if you want to support me in what I'm doing, which I would appreciate very much, you can become a Patreon. There is a ton of content there you know, that uh, you won't see on this channel, not just loads of videos getting into much more weirder areas than I do here, but also you can listen to all the music that I make there, all my albums are there, free to download. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you on the next one, and thanks for watching. Bye.